Hi everyone, Joshua Hinlin here, and I've just started an incredible several day trip down to Luxor and Aswan here in Egypt. And our very first stop for the day was here at the Karnak complex here in Luxor. I've got my guide Mahmoud here, and he has been taking us all around the site and telling us tons of incredible details in the history here at Karnak. So uh, how long have you been doing uh, guiding trips here in Egypt? Like 12 years. 12 years, so yeah. a lot of experience there. Of, yeah. <laughs> I'm also I'm teaching this kind of uh, science. I, I'm teaching Egyptology in the Faculty of Archaeology as well. Also, I'm working as a tour guide. Yeah. There you go. So uh, I'm trying to learn more and more and teach the students and teach the, my colleagues as well and learn from my colleagues and learn from my, from my students and learn from the people and the clients I, who I met every year, every day, every week, every you know month. So this is the way of life to learn more and more and more. So keep learning every day. I love that, and that's why yeah. we're here today at Karnak. So, yeah. so you just took us on an incredible tour of the whole complex. So for people who aren't familiar with Luxor and for Karnak, why is this site so important to the history of this area? I mean, Karnak especially, it is the biggest and largest, I mean, the religious complex ever in the world. So uh, it's a, the, the area is 62 feet in. It includes more than 16 temples and shrines and uh, a lot of chapels and we have so many columns and uh, also pylons we have 10 pylons we have two axes inside the temple this temple built started to build at least till today we, we which we discovered i mean the most ancient fragments we discovered the column which belongs to king entered the second from 11th dynasty it still exists still in the uh, uh, Luxor museum so maybe after new excavations, we discovered something earlier, earlier. But, but, but till today, it's the most ancient thing we discovered. So till the Greek and Roman and the Coptic period, we have Coptic graffiti inside this complex of Karnak. So Karnak, it's a very important place because the ancient name of Karnak is Ibitsu, the place of the thrones of the God. So yeah. <laughs> the place of the, the and but from the coronation procession for uh, the Egyptian kings, to be full king, full ruler of Egypt, you must add something for God Amr Ra inside his complex. That's why it's very important. And why everybody focus in this place nowadays? Because it's the most preserved complex and the most preserved temples and the biggest and largest artificial, I mean, uh, architectural place, uh, ancient architectural place in Egypt, especially in Luxor. And it was built during the Renaissance period of Egypt, the new kingdom period which include the best and the most famous names and the big names from the New Kingdom period, like from Ramses I till the 11th, Hatshepsut, uh, Libertari, Libertiti, Tutankhamonic, and all those kings from the New Kingdom period, that's why. So, Karnak is Karnak. <laughs> it's, it's an incredible yeah. site yeah. here. So, talk about some of the main features. One, one of my favorite parts, probably my favorite part of this whole site, is the uh, hippostyle hall with the, the massive uh, columns in there. Yeah. No, at Karnak we have the biggest for the biggest. I mean, the, we have here the biggest pylon and the biggest and the greatest hypestyle <laughs> hall. So, which is supported by 134 columns. So built by four kings, I mean Hatib the third, Ramses the first, Siddha the first, and Ramses the second. So it is an incredible area. The, I mean the hypestyle holes, as we mentioned before, that it represents the field of papyrus and the place of the pair of the divine birth of Horus and the, the the growing up of Horus area as well. So this is it is very important place and it is very important location. Uh, I mean. Uh, bar archaeological site in Egypt, Karnak, yeah. One interesting thing here at Karnak, and we might see this at some other sites as well, is the, the way that kings would get rid of some of the old hieroglyphics to put their own on there. So I think it was Ramses II, is that right, that kind of erased some of the older ones and replaced them with his own? Yeah, this is the way of life for King Ramses II, because he was in love with himself. Actually, he, he liked to re re record his name everywhere. So he's the most famous king in ancient Egyptian time from the 19th dynasty, so I think nowhere, no place with, uh, we can, in any place and everywhere we can find uh, monuments and names and uh, graffiti and, and descriptions and titles for King Ramses II. So Ramses II, his name is mentioned everywhere from uh, north to south. 
So Ramses II, the most famous and the most warrior, uh, famous warrior king in ancient Egyptian times as well. So Ramses II, he, he used to f f uh, chisel the names of the earlier and the previous kings and write down his name in the same place. So yeah. to record and to take the things, to make it f uh, belongs to him, <laughs> I don't know. But actually, maybe it's, uh, he have an idea in his mind, but we don't know it. But anyway, he did these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we know, we know this uh, statues, for example, it belongs to whom exactly? For, for example, we know it from the art, um, uh, artistic features, the details, some small elements of the uh, sculptures. So we know this belongs to whom exactly that? you know, belongs to King Ramses or not, or Tutmosis or not, or, or. So, and we, as we mentioned before also, the feature features of the, of the statues of the gods, even, it's taking the features of the king who mm -hmm. made those statues, because the king is, represents the face or the appearance of the god, and the god is, represents the appearance of the king. Yeah. Another incredible detail here in the complex is the obelisks, and there are several examples of yeah. the obelisks in here. What are what are some of the best examples? We just have two standing obelisks still exist, but we used to have more than uh, 17 obelisks inside, but all of them disappeared now, broken, and some of them uh, tra trans uh, transported to another countries like uh, Turkey, like uh, Paris, Italy, like no, no, the Paris. It came from Luxor Temple. Came, it came from Luxor. Okay. Yeah. So Luxor Temple. Okay. So uh, yeah. So some some of the obelisks moved from Karnak and uh, taken by the Romans to uh, and transferred to the different countries around the world. Yeah. So it's our ambassadors <laughs> in, in the uh, foreign countries. Yes. There you go. It's our free advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like a billboard. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah. thank you so much for yeah. the overview of this site. So this is just the first of many different sites that we'll be visiting on our trip here in Luxor and then down to Aswan. So we look forward to taking you on that journey with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Mark. You know, we can read hieroglyphics from left to right or right to left or up to down, but not from down to up. But to read the cartouche, it's something quite different, actually. So it's according, it depends the form or the figure or the, or the sign or the symbol facing to which side. If it's facing to the right side, we leave, read, we've started to read from right to left. Or if it's facing to the left side, so we started from left to right. And about the cartouches, you should like follow the, uh, the grammar way of reading. Plus, you have to respect the names of the gods. You should put the name of the god or the symbols which referring to the gods in the top, even if you are not read it at the beginning. For example, here, Men Khibr Ra, one, two, three. So we mentioned the name of God Ra at the end, but we put him in the top mm -hmm. because it's the name of the god. It's very important here. So we've made our way to the other end of the Avenue of Sphinxes from Karnak. We're now at the Luxor Temple. We mentioned Luxor Temple earlier as where uh, France got one of its obelisks from, right? Yes, uh, in 1838, actually, I, it's at seven. So Muhammad Ali Basha gave it as a gift to Louis number nine. He gave this obelisk, the uh, Western one, Western side obelisk. 
but the deal between Egypt and France during this time it was for the two obelisks. But thank God they took only one. <laughs> so yeah. there's still one so here. There's still one here. <laughs> By the way, they took the shorter one. The tallest one is still exists here in Egypt because the base over there you can see it is much bigger than the base in this one oh. which exists. So this is the biggest one here. Exists. Yeah, so Luxor Temple is one of the most preserved temples in ancient Egyptian pharaonic temple uh, time. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, you know, the, the, the first queen, the first achievements we discover in Saad Khan, Luxor Temple, the triple shrines which belongs to Queen Hatshepsut as well. Hatshepsut, she was the first queen or the first person to celebrate the festival of Obit from Karnak to Luxor. Uh, and then the rest of the king, they keep celebrating this festival of Abit till the end of Egyptian history. So King Ramses II reused those tribal, those tribal shrines and he rebuilt, rebuilt behind his uh, uh, first pylon. And then, the, the, but the, the most important achievements and the most, uh, the biggest part of achievements inside the Luxor Temple, which was built by King Amenhotep of the third and, and Ramses II. As you see, the facade now it's completed very simply from like a few years ago. They restored the three statues, the two from this side and then the middle one from the western side. So it had to be restored. But before that, it was just includes the right hand one, I mean the western one, and then the two seated statues in the middle. So it was exist here. All the statues from one single block, from red granite and black granite. Yeah. yeah, the uh, facade of Luxor Temple it include, or the main entrance includes the depicting of the battle scenes against the Hittites. So King Ramses II here represents his power against the Hittites. Yeah, so, so just like Karnak, Ramses II had a big impact here. He was working at both spots. Okay. Everywhere. Ramses, Ramses yeah. second everywhere. We'll see more of his work later on. He's more well. famous than me. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah. But one of the things I wanted to point out here was uh, when they first started excavating, the sand and dirt was very high. Wasn't it like up to the necks of the statues? Yes, the temple when it was discovered actually in 1858 by August Maria Pasha. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the temple was covered by dust and sand till this level, till the head, till the neck of the of the statue, to the street level, till the street level exactly. So the main towns and the main houses for the people who live around the Luxor city, in the middle of the area. Even Sheikh Abdul Hajjaj he came and built his mosque over. By the way, Luxor Temple is considered the religious com community because it includes pharaonic temple, Greek achievements, Roman achievements, also uh, Coptic church and mosque. All the religious, all the development of the religious and historical backgrounds of Egypt. Yeah. You can see records of Alexander the Great and adding his own designs and then the Romans with their frescoes over it. So yes, it's amazing yeah. to see the history. Yeah, yeah. The history. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a great temple. Yeah, and yeah. then just, just to, to this side over here is the uh, Sphinx Avenue, so that yeah. connects now the yeah. Luxor Temple yeah. and this Karnak. Is, yeah, this is the Sphinx Avenue, but in this side we have the human headed with a body flying, but in the Luxor, I mean, in, in front of Karnak Temple, the Temple of God Amun Ra, it will be ram headed and the body flying, okay? So we have different symbolism actually this because this temple has a part of the cults of the divine spirit of the king. So the head of the king as a protector, I mean the king himself as a protector of this temple as well, because there is a cult for the divine spirit of the king himself. But there inside the Karnak temple, no places for cults of kings or humans in general, but just cults, cults for uh, gods, that's it there. So this is the difference between the sphinxes here and there. There we go. So Karnak yeah. and Luxor temples and then the Avenue of Sphinxes, all a must-see, must-hit locations when yeah. you come here to Luxor.
We've made our way now to the west bank of Luxor, the other side of the river from Karnak and Luxor Temple, where we were yesterday, and we are in the Valley of the Kings, so another very iconic, very important historical location here in Luxor. Tell us a little bit about this site. So this is the Valley of the Kings. I think you don't need to know more than this. <laughs> Valley of the Kings. So Valley of the Kings, it's a great symmetry from the New Kingdom period, the Renaissance period of Egypt, actually. The most famous names, the most important kings of Egypt, they bury in this great cemetery, in this Valley of the Kings. So Valley of the Kings actually, uh, it's included till today, we discover 65 tombs. Right, by the way, from 1922 uh, till 2008, there is no more discoveries uh, because the last tomb discovered from 1922, the tomb of Tutankhamun, came on the Golden Pharaoh. But the last 10, 11 years, we discovered more free tombs. So now total 65 tombs, okay? So the, the, the most beautiful tombs here, uh, like King Rams, uh, City the first, the biggest one, the most famous one, and also the most preserved one, and the most expensive one at the same time. Also the tomb of Ramses the third, also the tomb of uh, Tutmosis the third, uh, so many tombs uh, available to visit, but not all the tombs you can visit because so many tombs in very bad conditions, uh, not very well preserved. Uh, the tomb of Tutum, uh, Tutankhamun tomb actually in the Valley of the Kings, uh, it is not beautiful as the other tombs, but it is nice because uh, the importance of this tomb comes from because of uh, because about the uh, uh, the treasures which discovered inside the Valley of the Kings inside the inside the tomb. So we discovered more than 5,500 pieces of gold there. So this tomb considered the, the, the most famous tomb because of the treasury, which we discovered inside, not because of the history, of the history of the king or the beauty of the tomb itself or the depictions which depicted in the walls. So, uh, I mean, you can visit six tombs, seven tombs here. We have private tombs like Ramses five and six. We have the tomb of uh, to think among, we have the tour of uh, city the first, okay? But uh, the, the, the classic tour or the last classic visits for the tombs of the, of the Valley of the Kings, you can choose three for each entrance fees, actually. You choose whatever you want from like seven or eight tombs open for visitors here. But it's ex excluding those three tombs, which I mentioned, the private tombs, like yeah. to think among, Rams 5 and 6 and city the first. So this is the Valley of the Kings. The, yeah, yeah. It's I mean lots lots of impressive tombs here. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the ones we went in. But you mentioned Tutankhamun's tomb. So we went in there, and the big draw here is his mummy is still in there. So a lot of the other mummies were moved to the new uh, Museum of Egyptian Civilization in yeah. Cairo. But his his mummy is still here. So that's kind of the big draw to go inside there. Yeah, you know that as I mentioned to be, uh, before that the, the tomb it's not beautiful. I mean the depiction or the scenes, nothing to see inside. Only some scenes representing some ch spell, uh, chapters from the Book of the Dead, the open mouth rituals, and the first hour part from the first hour from the Book of Emidwat which is presenting the baboons, the 12 baboons in the walls. So uh, actually, if there is nothing, I mean, if there is no mummy inside the tomb, you, nobody will visit it, I'm sure. Because this mummy makes this tomb now uh, worth to visit, actually. That's why they leave it here, <laughs> not with the other tombs and with the other mummies to the uh, National Museum. And the, the other tombs we went in were all from the Ramses line. So talk about some of those and kind of why you recommend people go in there and, and what types of things you can recommend see. Recommend tombs, you mean? Yes, like the, no, I the Ramses ones. Yeah, like yeah, what, I, what, what is so important and so beautiful about those? Yeah, for, for example, some people coming and they have some names, some tombs in their mind they want to visit. They have a list of tombs they want to cover. Some others, they don't have any idea about the numbers of the tombs or which tombs before, which king, okay? So uh, actually, the, uh, I, I, when I, I, I recommend people to visit some tombs here, I recommend the most important, the, uh, different, I mean different varieties, actually like uh, colors, deepest, paintings, sculptures. So you can cover as possible as you can from the three tombs, mm -hmm. like this. I'm very careful to let you or let the, the, the people who are coming to visit here to cover as possible as you can from different 
types and different style of tombs. And uh, you mentioned the painting there. I think that's one of the big highlights of coming to the tombs versus like Karnak or Luxor or some of the temples that the painting is so well preserved in some of these tombs and that really the color brings so much of it to life. Yeah, the color is amazing. The color is original. Uh, it's not uh, our Egyptian restoration school uh, to repaint again, just uh, preserved and doing conservations for the uh, uh, for the tombs and for the colors and the walls. That's it. But no paintings. Yeah, it's just just incredible here. And I do want to give a mention to our friend uh, Ramses the Second, who we've mentioned several times you now. See right, right behind this us tomb here. Actually known. <laughs> so, like here, this is the tomb of King Ramses the <laughs> Second, the most famous king. <laughs> but his tomb, it's the poorest tomb nowadays. I mean, it's completely damaged. Nobody can see it. Nobody can visit it. It was not open, and it will be not open for visitors, by the way. So this tomb in very bad condition now. It's still under restoration. Not safe on inside as well. Yeah, but I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's some of the uh, taste of the Valley of the Kings for you. So we'll keep yeah. checking out more on the West Bank now.
So look at here. This is the funeral procession. Look at here. Okay, so the funeral procession. Look at the friends of the uh, deceased, and this is the cult of King Emirhat of the Third, Nebmatra, the priest and his wife Queen T. Okay, they are worshipped them. The, 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 the King Emirhat uh, Third and his wife they worshipped as a gods. And this is the journey to Abydos. This is the boat. Look at the sea. The, 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 the fish and the lotus papyrus. And the servants and the priest presents offerings and doing purifications for the deceased of his wife. And look at here. This is the tomb. As I told you, remember when I told you any tomb in ancient Egyptian history should have a pyramid. In the top of the tomb, here we should have a pyramid from mud break, but we didn't find it. So that's why it's very important. Look at the mother. She's crying. Look at a little bit details. She's crying and doing, realizing the, 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 the eldest son of the deceased, he's uh, releasing the incense and doing the last touch and doing mummification for his father, okay? And then here, this is another card for Nebhebtra. Montohad al Nebhebtra, the small timber beside Hatshepsut. From 2500 BC, they worshiped him and his wife, Ahmed uh, Amin Nebhebtari. So uh, it's very important as well when she uh, worship and be worship as the gods during the ancient time. Hamid and Sut were the great royal wife, okay? And then here the goddess Hathor, she's coming from the, she's appearing, uh, she appeared from the mountain, the western mountain. And then you can see the, the deceased body. And then the body, when his soul returned back, this is the soul of the deceased, and returning back to the body, flying to be united, to return, let him return back to the life. Beautiful fresh colors, beautiful paintings here in King and Hot of the Third and his wife Queen T. Also, they are worshiping and receiving offerings, cold water from the deceased. So here, the king adoring to God Osiris, the deceased here, actually also the deceased here and the deceased here worshiping to God is smart, God is of justice. This is unfinished, no text, no details. So it's finished, uh, unfinished, and then the deceased and his wife worshiping to Osiris and Isis, worshiping to Bita, Bita, and Sekhmet. So this is very interesting tomb with a beautiful and a lot of details. You can see the lower part when they are transferring the funeral uh, ritual, uh, uh, funeral tools and uh, furnitures. To the boat, to the tomb, and look at the mourners, professional mourners. They are debate for to be crimes, to be an act like goddess Isis. And for the we have just few scenes represents the Egyptians wearing uh, jackets and uh, oh, uh, I mean uh, heavy dress, like winter winter cloth. dress, winter, winter cloth. Mm -hmm. Usually they appear like this. Without, I mean, very soft and very nice. So for the first time, very few scenes represents the winter's clothes, actually. Yeah. So now we're on the far side of the Valley of the Kings here at Deir El Medina, or Badi Mi, is that yeah, right? Correct. That's the, the no, ancient speak, name? You speak ancient digital language. <laughs> yeah, so I'm getting there. I'm yeah, getting that's there. Good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so this is the, the workers village here. This is where all of the workers who did all that incredible artistic work that we saw in the Valley of the Kings lived during their time working there. So tell us a little bit about kind of the, the lives of the workers here and, and how they worked over at the Valley of the Kings. No, this village we can say it is a very systemic village, have their own rules and courts and uh, judges and they have a mirror of the village uh, and there is a sort of logistic services. Some people look up, looked after the people, the workers here, bring them the water, bring them the food, all what they need. Also, we have a jail and we have a schools, we have a kitchen, storage rooms, so many, so many things to help uh, the people or the artisans and the workers who live in this village. So this village started to, to be, uh, I mean, completed during the new kingdom period, during the reign of King Tutmosis the I, the father of Queen Hatshepsut. Uh, he started to build these achievements here, the room, the, 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 I mean the buildings here, the houses. It's very well and very clear. Uh, it's a very crowded houses. Uh, the, 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 the numbers of the people who live or the workers who, who used to live inside this 
uh, village or those houses changed from year to year, from period to period, from king to king, actually. And all of them, they are sharing the same walls, but the, 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 the sizes of the houses actually changed from the uh, categories, the, the ranking of the people. Actually, if you are a high official, that I mean, the big chief of porkers, you have a, a good house, a big mm -hmm. house. You are, you're a professional a little bit, uh, I mean, lower, that you'll have a good house, not bad and then until you have the smallest one. So uh, in this and, uh, I mean, village of Orkers, we discovered a lot of fragments. We, we call it uh, uh, Ostraka. Ostraka is a piece from pottery or a piece of uh, bone, uh, animal bones or human bones, whatever I mean. So uh, we discovered some, uh, not human bones, but animal bones actually, and the pottery and the piece of stones. So we discovered so many uh, informations. They would write on the bones. Right in the bones, yes. And also uh, the uh, pottery and the piece of stones. Everything about their life, their cultures, to how they live, the, 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 the communications between each other, the contracts, the marriage stealers, the marriage, I mean, uh, uh, contracts. So everything we've discovered here. I think that 80% of the social life of, uh, of the ancient Egyptian and the, all the information of the social life we're talking from the village of Orkers of or Dir Medina. Yeah. So this is one of the most important things about this. So when the workers died, they buried in the same place, but facing to their houses. That means this is the first life house and this is the afterlife house. Exactly, facing, facing to each other. Yeah, okay. so the, the, the tombs here where the people are buried is yes. like the afterlife house. So Correct. there's some really well-decorated tombs in addition to the village. Yes, they should have a very good tomb because it's a very... They are the chief of artists and the artists who draw the tombs of the Valley of the Kings. So they should have a very good tomb. <laughs> yeah, and you mentioned a really important point there about, about like 80% of the information we have about like the artists and kind of everyday Egyptians yeah, come, comes yeah, from this yeah, site. Because yes. so many of the temples and the Valley of the Kings and everything tell us about the rulers, but we don't know a lot about kind of the average people, uh, the less powerful people. Yeah, yeah, the average people, so the less powerful. We took it from here and we studied it. And the, the most of those Ostraka had been studied in Leiden University in uh, Netherlands, actually. Uh, you know, so many things we discovered here. Yeah, temples for Garatmai, the shrines, so many things. Yeah, mm -hmm. fascinating. So, uh, another another really unique, very impressive site. Yeah, yeah, this is a very great site. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Got to be thin for this one. Yeah. Yeah. Watch your head.
Just a short drive on the west bank from the Valley of the Kings is the incredible Hatshepsut's temple here. And there's a lot going on in this temple, but why don't you start by giving us kind of an, an overview of the, the history of this site and what we know about this temple. Yeah, the history of this site called Jisr Jisru Iman. This is the most holy place and site in the Western Thebes. So the ancient name of the whole site, Jisr Jisru Iman, which means the Holy Fathers of Amun. And it includes a lot of achievements. It started by the temple of King Montohat ibn Habitra over there, which built by King Montohat ibn Habitra from 11th, the, the 11th dynasty. Uh, Not much then, of that temple left. <laughs> no, no, actually, the, all the, the most of the ruins and the most of the columns and the f blocks of this temple reused in this new temple of Queen Hatshepsut. So they used the temple of Montohadib Hanab Habitra as a quarry, actually. So that's why they polished when they started to restore uh, the temples in this area. They started with the temple of Queen Hatshepsut and now they are working in the temple of King Tutmont III, but they were never finished restoration of this temple of King uh, or they cannot rebuild it again because all uh, already the columns and the walls uh, reused in this great uh, temple of Queen Hatshepsut. So the, this area considered the most important area. There is a very ancient cult here dedicated to goddess Hathor and also uh, the, the style of building in these temples in this area. It's very unique. You're not found it anywhere else. Started by King Montohat ibn Habitra when he started to, do, to build a ramp and porticos and hall of columns. And then here also, Hatshepsut, she took the same design, but she make it much, much bigger than, than the other. And then she took also the columns and the walls. And then she made, she built also the, her, her genius architect, Tenen Mut. He built a ramp and porticos and then another ramp and porticos and shrine, chapel for Anubi, chapel for Hathor. And then the last terrace, which include uh, the, the beautiful statues for goddess, uh, for Queen Hatshepsut, while she's wearing double crown and the other side wearing the white crown and then festival court and then the holy falls. The last part of the temple, I mean the holy fall, I mean the, the festival court includes so many shrines like ch chapel for Amun, chapel for Raharakhti, shrine for King Tutmos I, the father of Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut as a god, also for Hatshepsut herself as a goddess. So, and then the main holy fall is which dedicated to God Amun-Ra. During Greek and Roman, I mean, during Greek and Roman period, there is a new cult happens and added new extension added inside the holy fall of God Amun-Ra uh, for the cult of two architects from the ancient times, from old kingdom period, third dynasty, the architect of King Joseph, his name is Imhotep, also the architect of King Amen Hotep the third, Amen Hotep son of Hap. Both of them they were worshipped as the gods of medicine and architect during Greek and Roman period. So this is a very unique. Also, this temple of Queen Hatshepsut, it's maybe we can consider it the only temple built by limestone. The rest of the temples built by sandstone. So it's a very special temple, yeah. really, for everything. Lots of unique things to see here. One thing I wanted to bring up was she was a rather controversial ruler. Um, yeah. So something you see on this temple is her name has been uh, erased. There's a problem that is matching between Hatshepsut and her stepson, Tutmos III. It's the reason he uh, decided to chisel her names and her figures from her temple uh, to disappear her names and her appearances everywhere. So that's why, because uh, because had to love with the throne, and she tried too much, to, so much time to kick him out, and then make him, uh, I mean, uh, as a warrior and, and as a fighter to fight foreign countries. Maybe she wanted to let him die there, but she always went and returned back, and uh, she keep sending him again, and then she went and returned back, and then finally he know that she wanted to let him die, and then he decides to. Kill her, uh, kill Hatshepsut, and destroy her monuments, and hold her names from everywhere. Yes. Yeah. So the story doesn't end so well for her. But By the way, we have three ways of destroying destroying in this temple. Yeah. We have natural, then from the earthquake, which happened here, so many color, so many blocks from the mountain fell down. All the uh, political between Tutmos the third and Hatshepsut, also religious between the followers of God Amur Ra and the followers of God Aton during the Atonism period, I mean during Akhenaton period, mm -hmm. from 18th dynasty, the son of King Amun Hadab III. When he, when he stopped worshipping for Amun and started to worship to King uh, God Aten. 
So, and then he chiseled all the figures of Amun from this temple and other temples. And then after the disappearing of religion of Aten and returning back the power of God Amun Ra back, and then the, the priest and the worker they started to redraw the names and the figures of God Amun Ra again. So we have three ways of striding and you know, chiseling yeah. inside this temple. That's really interesting. So you've got political, religious, and kind of natural forces yeah, all at yeah. work, and the, the temple has to try and survive correct. in the midst of all that over the centuries. Yes, yeah, correct. <laughs> Another really neat part of this temple uh, over here on the left side, it tells the story of a, a great expedition yeah, that she the, organized. So where yeah. where was that? The Bond Island expedition. It was, well, I'm not very sure where, it, but it's in the south. I mean, of Africa. I mean, maybe it's in. Uh, <laughs> Ethiopia, maybe uh, Somalia, we are not very sure because the French uh, expedition working there doing study uh, researches and studying the fragments of these great places. So this expedition had been recorded and depicted in this temple because Hachizu, she sent servants and her workers under the leadership of Ban, ba, Bani Hasi. And then he went there to bring from their, their product, the, the most famous products like incense, glue, frankincense, gum, animals, giraffe, uh, cows, buffaloes, uh, monkeys, so many things. And we give them our products like we eat so, uh, and papers and, and, and. So uh, actually uh, it was a very great expedition. But Hachif, the, the expedition of Bond Island during the time of, of Queen Hatshepsut was very famous. Why? She was, I mean, wasn't the first person or ruler make the deal and cooperation between Egypt and Bond Island. But uh, we used to have a very good relationship with Bond Island from a long time ago, from maybe the Old Kingdom period. But the most important thing that here, because Hatshepsut, she's the only queen to record this story in her temple. Still on the West Bank in Luxor and we've found these two massive statues behind us here. So there used to be a full temple along with these statues. But before we get into that, I want to ask you about the name of these because that's a very important point. So tell us kind of the background and what the names of these statues are. You know, originally and the uh, main names of this temple, actually and the founder of this temple and the statues and the owner of those statues, and those statues represent King Ibn Hatib III from 18th dynasty, the grandfather of King Tut and the father of King Amun, I mean Ikhenaten. During the uh, Greek period, actually, we have a legend, you know, the Tri legend, actually. Mm -hmm. And then the, when the mother uh, of Agamemnon, after he killed by Achilles, and she walked beside this statue, and this statue was cracked because of the earthquake, when, uh, which happened in 27th century BC. So because of this earthquake, actually, this right hand statue cracked in the middle and then the wind going through the crackings every early morning and makes sounds like somebody crying. And the uh, mother of all the, the legend started to be created now. So the, the Greek, they give the name of Agamemnon for this statue because they said that God, the, 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 these voices are the voices of the gods. They are crying and they are very sad for the death of Agamemnon. So, uh, from this day, when they give this name of Agamemnon to this statue, so all the Greek and the Romans visitors come and left their gravitas. It's like a tourist language. attraction. Yeah, so many evidence talk about this uh, legend and Agamemnon as well. But this one not, actually. So, originally supposed to be, the, uh, and they give this name for Agamemnon. Years after years, actually, the, uh, during the Roman period, Emperor Septimus Severus, the Roman emperor, he just uh, make restoration for this one again, and then no sounds anymore, but the name is still, okay? 
But years after years, they give for both of them Memnon name. But it's so wrong. The Colossus of Memnon now should be the study of Memnon, the right hand side, that's side one. And also the, uh, we can say the north, uh, the northern one, only Memnon. But originally both of them belongs to King Ibn Hatib the third. Yes. Okay. No, that that's yeah, a good clarification. But, yeah, but actually the temple is considered the biggest and largest temple built ever in the world <laughs> by one king. Yes, this is the temple of King Ibn Hatib the third. Started by two series statues at the big pylon, and then open court, and another two series statues, and then pylon, open court, and third <laughs> series statues, and open court actually. So, consider the biggest and largest temple built ever in the world. Okay, it's not bigger than Karna, Karakata complex, built by so many kings from different dynasties and different periods. So, and then we have the Holy Hollies, and then to the north side, we have a great statues still standing in the middle of the field. To the south, we have in the middle of the field, supposed to have a great tour study for King Amenhat III and his wife, Queen T. Now it's located in Cairo, Cairo Museum. So the German mission working here from a long time ago to discover, make excavation to discover the rest of the temple and the achievements. So we hope to discover them. By the way, so many kings, after the period of King Amenhat III, they used this temple as a quarry when it was destroyed. Okay, from the earthquake. So, so many statues, so many stones, so many columns are used in later kings' temples, like Madrid have a temple by King Ibn Ramsay the Third or other places. So, every day we have new things discovered beside this great temple of King Ibn Hatib the Third. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's truly colossal statues here. Even if only one of them is a Agamemnon statue, but a, an amazing sight. Uh, even without the full temple remaining, just coming out here and seeing, uh, kind of picturing the size of this is incredible. So thank you. Thank you. We are now in the midst of the incredible Medinet Habu temple complex built by Ramses III here on the West Bank. And this is one of my favorite temple sites to visit in all of Luxor. It's massive to walk around and there's tons of artistic depictions and stories on the walls. So we'll start with this one right behind us here. Tell us a little bit about what this depicts and how that represents uh, Ramses III as a ruler here. Yeah, you know that Ramses III, we consider him, the scholars consider Ramses III as the last warrior king in ancient Egyptian history. And he did a lot of battles against his three main battles against the sea people actually. And then he uh, always depicted himself in warrior as a warrior king and in battle positions and fighting positions as well. So uh, in this scene, he just want to show us his power and how he fight the enemies as animals as uh, and as he's doing fishing as well. So if you look at the pole here, the two poles, one fell down already and the other one it's about to fill down because it's arrived, almost arrived to the lake or the canal. So look at the tongue out because the, you know, the pole here is very heavy, very big, I mean, very... Uh, worn out. Yeah, worn out actually. And then uh, the, in the lower register, you can see the level, I mean, the group or lines of the uh, of the sons of King Ramses the, the third. They are helping their father while they, while, while he's hunting this great pole. And then also you can see the artistic figures and elements of this wall. We can see this wall. We can talk about religion, about philosophy, about uh, w battles, wars, about art as well. So the artist here, he show us his skills and he's showing his power of skills as well. If you look at the plants which grow beside or in the bank of the water, actually on the lake here, you can find the beautiful plants growing up. And then when it's when the figure or, or the representations of this plant united and uh, matching with the body of the uh, pole or the animal, 
So the artist, he started from the bottom high sank leaves. And then when, when it is matching with the body of the pole or the animal, so it's uh, getting high. Released, Raised. And then, yeah, high and then after that return back deep. So he want to show us that his power, uh, show his skill and uh, tell us that these scenes and this fighting or this hunting happened behind those plants, not in front of the plants. So this is one of the great uh, scenes I, I can say, yes. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Do you think so? No, I agree. I, this, this is one of inc many incredible scenes just here in this temple. Mm -hmm. So it's a way for the artist to kind of create perspective almost with the scene. Yeah. It's uh, create almost a 3D type of effect. More than 3D. Put you in the scene like you're Most there more. watching it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a great scene. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, the artist play with the, with the walls, with the sandstones as he's playing with like uh, sponge or something, you know? <laughs> really, yeah. you do whatever you want with the scenes, the artist, the pole. Look at the action and the movement. Exactly similar when it's just about, you know, filled out. And then haunted by him, by the king, Ramses the first. An yeah. Another uh, really uh, unique artistic kind of approach in this temple is the very deep hieroglyphics here. And this is something you see throughout the whole temple. What, what was the reason for yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. We have inside the temple of King Ramses III at Medina Tabu area. So very deep inscriptions. We can consider the deepest inscriptions ever. Because, you know, that King Ramses II, he considered his grandfather, Ramses II, uh, as uh, his idol, he's a star. So, and he's tracking him for and everything, everywhere. I mean, tracking his, and he's following his art, following his architects. And even when he gave names for his sons, he followed and tracking King Ramses II when he gives his names, uh, names for his children. Mm -hmm. So the similar. I mean, King Ramses III, you know that Ramses II, he talked and reused so many uh, temples for which which originally belongs to previous and area of kings. We saw that, yeah, yeah, in Karnak. So many places and so many studies happened. So, and Ramses II he chiseled and erased this, those names which belongs to the previous kings and wrote down his name. So King Ramses the third, he still respect King Ramses the second, but he want to protect his <laughs> things. So he learned from these bad situations and he decided to make it very deep. Okay, you can put your fingers, your hands inside this inscription. So if anyone try or think to chisel it, maybe the wall will fill down over his head. You'd it's have to go very deep, deep to, yeah, to yeah, erase that. Correct, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the why they have very deep inscriptions. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. talk a little bit more about the temple site in general here. What are the yeah, main kind of the, architectural features? Yeah, the uh, Medina Tabo area, we consider it as Karnak of the West Bank. The Karnak of West Bank, because it includes a, a lot of uh, archaeological uh, sites, I mean, uh, archaeological temples, uh, uh, shrines. We have uh, houses as well, from different periods as well. From the started, we have the most ancient achievements we discovered inside the complex of Medina Temple. Temple belongs to Queen, uh, built by Queen Hachisun and King Tutmos III as well. We have the Temple of King Ramses III and the, the Divine Royal Wives Chapels. Also, we have the House of Butih Amun at the far end of the temple from the western side. Uh, the one who collect all the mummies from the valley, the kings, and rebury them uh, in, uh, in the great uh, big shaft in, uh, in the area of Deir al-Bahri, which was discovered in, in 1881. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, also, we have his house, and uh, during Coptic period, this place was a big community, and the most famous community belongs to the Christians. Yes, uh, yeah, this place actually, or Medina Tabo, was very important, and the very beautiful details. Please, I, I, I wish that everybody come to Egypt should visit this place. It's it's worth to visit, and you will love it. I agree. Okay. One of, one of the things that makes this such an exciting place to, to visit mm. is 
uh, as we saw with this, this depiction here, there's so much action on the walls. So Ramses III, as you mentioned, kind of the, the last warrior king of Egypt. Yeah. And he really represented a lot of his, the, the warrior side uh, of his reign uh, within mm -hmm. the walls here. Um, even, even depicting uh, the more graphic parts like the, the hands and the tongues of prisoners that, yeah. they had, uh, that they had cut off in battle. So there's so many of those depictions throughout the temple. Yes, because as I told you that the king Ramses the third, the third, he was one of the most famous warrior kings and the last important warrior king in ancient Egyptian time. So he did a lot of battles and he loved to be a warrior king. That's why he depicted his battle scenes in his temple to show his power, especially in the outer parts. Usually he depicted the battle scenes in the outer walls because the people or the common people used to walk around the <laughs> temple, not uh, inside the temple to show his power and sharing his activities with the people and let him, you know, make him very famous and warrior king according to their vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. Yeah. Yeah. It's another great example of kind of the religious and political kind of connection between these temples. Yeah. You have to know this. This is a temple. Any temple we have been. And when you found the battle scenes, for, for example, real or existing, already existing country fighting and uh, conquered by Egyptians or Egyptian army going and fight them. Okay, it's real things and real stories, but when they depicted in temples, temples is religious building. What's the relation between the religious and uh, f battles or wars? No, there is a religious background behind the scene, behind these uh, images. For example, we can see here the king over the chariots, okay? Or here, the king here fighting the enemies and holding the enemies. So the king, he did, when he represents himself here, the enemies, they are representations and they are the appearance and they are the form of evil. Mm -hmm. And the concept of evil in general. I don't mean to mention only those people, the, the enemies themselves or the people specifically. But he just beating, he want to say that I beat the enemies, I killed the enemies, uh, I killed the evil spirits, I called Isfit in ancient Egyptian language. So it's very important to know this. This scenes, battle or war scenes, it's when you, when you see it for the first time, it's, you're fine. You think it's, uh, I mean, uh, political or, uh, you know, fighting scenes, but it is, has a religious background, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fascinating stuff. So, yeah. so much fun to walk around this site here and yeah. definitely one of the, the top recommendations for any visit to Luxor. Yeah.
We're inside now in one of the tombs in the Valley of the Nobles. So this is kind of the less famous version of the Valley of the Kings, but still some incredible remains and tombs here. So how many tombs are there in the Valley of the Nobles? Uh, till today, they're still dis discovering more tombs in the Valley of the Nobles. So we discover around more than like uh, 800 or 850 tombs, private tombs for ministers and priests and uh, war, I mean, I mean the high officials, scribes. Uh, I mean, tombs for not royals, but for uh, private, for high officials. High ranking yeah, people. High ranking government. people yeah. So, like this yeah. one was the, the yes. mayor of Luxor, right? Yes, during the reign of King Tutmosis the third. It's yeah. very important. To me, to be mayor of Luxor, it's okay. But <laughs> during the reign of Tutmosis the third, something different. Tutmosis mm -hmm. the third, the one who made from Egypt a great empire. Really, mm -hmm. so that's why it's very. Uh, his tomb is very amazing, and his autobiography over there. He's talking about his history with the king that was the third, and uh, his relationship with him, with him, and uh, how uh, that was the third taught him so many good things, to be a good man and good and very kind and peaceful with the people. And when you do projects, you have to do it per perfectly because you are do it for the God, and the gods always see you. So. This tomb actually, uh, it includes very beautiful uh, scenes talking about all kinds of crafts, crafts and works in ancient Egyptian history, like the wooden crafts, uh, alabaster crafts, uh, butcher crafts, a uh, lizard animal, I mean, I mean uh, animal skin. So, uh, so many different works you will find this tomb. Yeah, it's like a gallery actually to see everything inside this tomb. So also you find the, uh, the tomb like the other tombs of nobles, T-shape, and the outer open court. So the outer open court is supposed to be decorated, but it's damaged. And then the, 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 the first uh, part of the room, it's to the right, so convert, I mean divided to right and left hand side. Actually you found the people and the servants presenting all offerings as a taxes for the, for the, for the uh, Meyer Fluxor. Uh, Rechmira, okay, and his name is Rechmira. Rechmira means the one who knows like Ra. Mm -hmm. So it's a very strong name, by the way. <laughs> and then the other side, it's also harvest scenes. So it's a very beautiful uh, scenes, as we mentioned, but it's a very dark inside. Right. Yeah? But anyway, uh, you'll find also the people from different countries during the time of King Titmar III presenting their uh, local products as offerings and as a taxes for Egypt. Yeah, like uh, Africans and Nubians and uh, Palestinians and Syrians, all of them they are present their offer their their paying product. tribute sort of yeah, yeah because yeah, because they, Egypt was very powerful during this yes, time. Yes, correct. And then the, the main section of the tomb again, it's dark in here, but yeah. this is kind of the main section. What what all does that? No, the, all those sculptures actually uh, the, the, the the handmade works like the alabaster, the wooden crafts. Furniture. They are making furniture. The workers and servants. They are making furnitures, and uh, making jars uh, from pottery and making mud breaks. Uh, yeah, so many crafts depicted in the walls. Also, they will found uh, religious scenes, and the, 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 the purifications and presenting offerings to the gods. Uh, and then the, the this part ended by false door, which which consider the, the, the screen between the first life and the afterlife and then the, the sword can come and go through this gate, I mean false gate, to use these offerings to keep living the afterlife. Yeah, this tomb is one of the best tombs here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really is beautiful and uh, even though it's the, the Valley of the Nobles, there's still some, some incredible tombs and incredible things, decorations and art to see on the wall. Yeah, correct. So we are building uh, decorations for the jars from alabaster stalls or water. This is alabaster works. And this is the transferring the blocks to the stalls. And this is how they make the statues. This is the final touch for the statue when they after they trans uh, transfer it from the quarry to the temple. They polish it and doing the inscriptions. Look how many persons, more than four people working in one statue. Here also the space, like this, like for example, three people working, another stadium for two people, like this. Here five, five people walking in this standing stadium of King the Moses the Third, and then here watching the mile, I mean the, the, the owner of the tomb is watching over this 
workers who are there doing their works. على الله سيدنا النبي هذا الشغل خالص ما فيش داعي عن الثلاثة هذا على طول داخل صح؟ لا يا ابني ده هو الطلبة هو الطلبة ماشي من تحت الطلبة ده تحت هو الطلبة ده تحت هو الطلبة ده أنا عامل لك ثلاثة هذا هو الطلبة كثير جوه Senhora, isso vai começar. Hi there, Joshua Hinlin here, and today we are on board the fantastic Nile cruise ship, the Semiramis 3. We got on board in Luxor and then sailed down the Nile, stopped at the Esna Locks last night, and then this morning had a fantastic trip to the uh, Edfu Temple uh, on the way down the Nile. So Edfu Temple is a really incredible spot to visit. It's considered kind of the best preserved ancient temple in Egypt, isn't it? Sure, this temple, one of the best and the most preserved temples and dedicated to the most famous god in ancient Egyptian history, God Horus. Uh, Horus Behdet, okay, Horus, the god of Edfu. So, uh, there was a great temple built during, during Pharaonic period, but this actually, Pharaonic period now, underneath, it's covered by dust and sand, so completely buried by dust and houses and the street level there covering around more than nine meters high of this inner or the ancient pharaonic temple. And uh, the most ancient names we found and we discovered in this fragment of, of the pharaonic temple, which is dedicated to God Horus, Hor Bahdet, the, the, the name of King Seti the first and then Ramses the third, also Ramses the fourth. But during Greek Roman period, actually, they reduced so many blocks and so many uh, columns so many statues as well of this ancient Pharaonic temple which they gave to God Horus. So, and they uh, built a new temple, but with different acts, north and south, because the original temple was to be facing to the north and south, I mean, east and west, mm -hmm. okay? The, so the traditional design of the uh, axis of the temples in ancient Egypt, east and west. But during Greek and Roman period, the, when they rebuild a new temple, they uh, make it uh, north and south. So they used so many blocks, so many columns, so many statues from this ancient pharaonic temple. Uh, you know, started by King Ptolemy III, around 200, 200, 237 BC till 57. I mean, 
BC. Mm -hmm. So more than like 180 years building in this great temple. More than 180 years. So uh, you know, uh, the be the beautiful, the, the, the also the most interesting thing that, that about this temple that this one, this temple, one of the most preserved temples in ancient Egyptian history. So from the entrance to the uh, Holy Falls, completely preser preser preserved in constructions. I mean, the walls and the columns still exist, but the scenes and the colors not exist completely. I mean, we can say, yes, the most of the scenes and sculptures inside the temple still preserved, but some chiseling which, you, which made by the later, I mean, the, the first Christians in Egypt. Uh, also, uh, the uh, colors, some parts which save from the sun still preserved, some colored parts. Also, this temple, it's the only temple actually talking about, in detail, about the legend of Winged Sun Desk. I mean, the battle between Horus and his uncle Set. When Set transformed into so many forms like uh, uh, crocodiles, hippopotamus, uh, yeah. And then the stories and the outer, uh, the outer corridor actually, and the walls depicted with the beautiful scenes, which represents the great battle and fighting between Horus and Set. Yes, also we have in this temple the beautiful meeting scene. I mean, the, 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 the scenes of the beautiful meeting between God Horus, Behdet, and his wife Hathor. Because Hathor, she's in it for the wife of Horus, but she had her temple in Dandra, around 50 or 60 kilometers from the north of Luxor. She She's there, the supreme God is there. So when you start to count the the the, the three out of the temple of Dendera, you start uh, you started by with the goddess Hathor name. So Hathor and uh, Hur Behdet and Hur Ihid. But the three out of eight for temple starts with the supreme god Hur Behdet and Hathor and Hur Samantawi. So this is the uh, great uh, I mean events which happening. Also one of the great events which happening in uh, celebrated inside this temple the New Year Festival, which renewing the power and the energy of the scenes and the stadiums every year. Uh, it is, yeah, one of the great temples, one of the best temples in Egypt. The also, the most interesting thing, thing that the, o the only way you go to this, to go to this temple by horse and carriage. <laughs> yes, yes, that's also true. So you get the, the extra addition of a fun horse and carriage ride. Yes, <laughs> to go to the Temple of Horse, you should ride the horse. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, so you mentioned uh, the the Coptic Christians kind of uh, chiseled away at a lot of the the characters, and that's something that's very noticeable when you look around. Almost all the characters on the the temple walls have been chiseled away. Talk about kind of why why the Christians would do that, and and how they went about doing that. What 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 were they trying to chisel away? Yeah, first of all the when I'm saying that Christians did this, I'm just saying that the Christians did it not in religion. I mean, they don't want to destroy the things, but this is just religious backgrounds. They don't uh, believe in this, in the, in the, uh, in, uh, on this, uh, those gods and uh, these scenes and this temple and these cults, actually. They just want to disappear and chisel the figures and they want to forget about this previous religion because the Christians they were Egyptians so they are native Egyptians so uh, but they change I mean they worship for a new I mean uh, and they believe in new religion the Christianity so the mentality and the the concepts of the uh, previous religion I mean the ancient Egyptian gods okay in their minds and they know the secrets of the scenes and secrets of the temples and the secrets of the religion so they know that there is spirits inside those images. That's why uh, the scenes on the walls of the temples or the tombs, they are depicted in present continuous. I mean, the king giving and the god receiving. So the ING is it. I mean, present continuous. So uh, it's not happened already. I mean, not happened yet. So it's keep giving and keep receiving the god. So it's very important. So the ancient Egyptians, I mean, believe inside those images, the power, the energy, the souls, 
okay can do this ritual every second can receiving every offerings every second can giving offerings every second as well so this is very important as well the uh, when the christian uh, the christians okay uh, i mean the later egyptians when they believe in the new uh, new religion new let the christianity yeah. in general so they had this this ideas this concept since still in their mind and their mentalities actually so they they want to stop those uh, events or those rituals and they want to stop them to give offerings or receiving offerings so they just want to, to stop them so that's mm -hmm. that's why the most of the scenes chiseled from the legs and the heads and the hands sometimes sometimes the full image chiseled sometimes no touch I mean no uh, scenes without any touch so I mean one is for all so if you ch chisel one figure for Horus for example all the figures of Horus uh, it seems like it has, it has been chiseled mm -hmm. and the, the, it will be stopped no no soul anymore would be in this actually scenes also for Hathor or Osiris or uh, Maat or Isis or whatever you just had to chisel yeah. one of them, and it's as if they got rid of all of them. Correct. Yeah. So it's an interesting. So expired. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's an interesting example of that transition, kind of from the ancient Egyptian beliefs to the the Christian beliefs, and how they they had converted to Christianity, but at the same time still thought there was this power in the ancient Egyptian beliefs that they had to uh, remove these figures okay. from the walls. Nothing can be changed directly. It needs time. I mean, it mm -hmm. takes time to change the mentality, especially in religions and uh, yeah. religious and mentalities. So you, you, yesterday you was believing something, and today you believe in another thing. So you cannot completely, you cannot com uh, forget about this previous religion. So this, uh, the, that's why what I'm saying to you that the Christians, they, st they still have a very good knowledge about ancient Egyptian religion. So, according to this knowledge, they chisel these figures because they want to uh, stop them doing right. or receiving, at least now. They don't believe in them anymore, but just in case, you know, <laughs> chiseling them. So, you, you mentioned as well, this, this temple was built uh, by the Greeks and Romans, so it's much more recent than a lot of what we saw, say like Karnak or the Luxor Temple, places like that. Uh, so was there a big difference in the architectural style of it or did the Greeks kind of just replicate what the ancient Egyptians had done? Okay, I never said the temples built by Greek and Romans. It is Egyptian temples built during Greek and oh, Romans. Oh, okay, the important point. Thank it's you. Very important because the style of buildings of Greek or Romans, they have their own style. I mean, you can found it in Egypt only in Alexandria, okay, but the upper Egypt temples or shrines, which which was built during Greek and uh, Roman periods, still Egyptian style, because who built these temples? Egyptian workers. Who worked inside these temples? Egyptian priests. Mm -hmm. Who depict these beautiful scenes and these languages, which depicted was this language, which and the text which written inside the temple, Egyptian scribes and Egyptian, Egyptian artists. So, still Egyptian, okay. So, uh, yeah, you know, it's still, it's, uh, that's why, but, but they make their language more difficult, actually. The, the, the Egyptians, the Egyptian scribes, the Egyptian artists who draw and depict these texts or, or, see, or scenes inside the temples during the Greek and Roman period, they still, because the ancient Egyptians, they still consider the Greek and Roman intruders. They're still in intruders. So, uh, and the Egyptian language, very holy language, mm -hmm. very sacred. So. So they want to protect it, they want to save it and keep it sacred, actually. So they said, uh, okay, we should do it more difficult because some of the Greek and some of the Romans started to know about the language of ancient Egypt. So the, the hieroglyphic texts were written during the Greek period, more difficult than the Pharaonic period. And also the hieroglyphic, which was written during the Roman period, more, much more difficult than the Greek and Pharaonic period. Really? Yes, you keep make it difficult. So to keep it secret, to you make it hard. They changed so many uh, about the language. They changed so many letters, the, the the phonetics, the meanings as well. As well. Yeah, it is a subject very interesting. You know.
trying to preserve the language from the Greeks and the Romans coming in. Yes, and uh, yeah. yeah. So we, we also talked about the, the horse and carriage ride that you take to get there. So it's a, it's a very interesting experience visiting this temple versus the ones we went to in Luxor because we, you take the Nile cruise ship down and then all of these ships arrive at the same time. So there's these massive crowds that come into the temple. So you had to work through the crowds a lot more. Yeah, Let, let's say an example, by the way. So they, if, if we have 50,000 people visiting Luxor in two days, and we have like five classic uh, visit or sites in Luxor. So those 50,000 people, they separated. Spread out. Uh, uh, spread out actually in those five places in two days. So maybe you found a little bit space <laughs> when different times, different schedules. But after you leave Luxor and sail to Islam, then you pass Islam, you go to Common Waitful you will visit it for all those 50,000 people going to the temple in one time, one shot. You see, I mean, in three, four hours, all those people, all those big numbers, all those guests actually visit the temple of it for one time. So it is very crowded, yes. And all of them going by horse and carriages, you know, <laughs> fighting, yeah. So uh, it's, it's like adventure, it's like yeah. experience, but uh, yeah, it's nice. And no, it's different. a fun something, experience. Some, yeah, no, it's different. very different. Yes. I know it's not, uh, I mean, modern horse and carriage or modern streets and nice. And, but uh, inshallah in the future it will be nice and uh, clean and uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a unique experience like almost everything in Egypt is a yeah. unique experience. Yeah, <laughs> so correct. It's definitely worth it. We've taken our Nile cruise ship down to Kamambo now. It's our next stop before we get down to Aswan. And this is the site of another fantastic temple. So yeah. tell us about uh, what is so important at Kamambo? Why do the ships stop here to check out this site? Actually, if the boats or the ships, ships didn't stop in this point, that means you'll never enter to Aswan because this stuff very important to visit the temple of the, I mean, of God Sobekara and the temple of God Horwer. The dual temple actually, did this temple dedicated, the only temple in Egypt dedicated for two triads. Actually, the first triad consists of God Horwer and his wife Tasenet Nefret and the little son Barib Tawi. And the other triad actually consists of uh, God uh, Sobekara and uh, his wife Garis Hathor and the little son Khonsohor. So, and those temples actually merged together, actually they united together in everything, so they sharing everything, because this is the main idea of this main uh, gods, and uh, the, that's why they build a temple for those gods to be sharing everything, yeah. So when you go to present offerings, you should present it for both of them, not for Sobek only or not for God uh, uh, horror only so you should present it for both of them so this temple actually the exist temple which, uh, which still exists preserved till today this temple built during greek and roman period so started almost like uh, the, the, from the started by king Ptolemy number five till Ptolemy number 12 and during roman period we have achievements built by uh, two emperors tiberius i mean the two most famous emperors uh, from the roman uh, period actually the uh, Emperor Tiberius and Emperor Claudius. So they added the 16 columns in the first open court. So uh, Komombo actually, uh, it is very famous was the crocodile god. Even he was the, f the, the, the god of evil, or the uh, symbol of evil in ancient Egyptian times. But he's the mo more famous in this temple actually because he's so weird, I mean strange animal actually. It is, crocodile so everybody's carrying crocodile so that's why it is more famous when you say or mention Komombo to anyone he will just directly tell you that oh Sobekra or crocodile yeah or the crocodile god but uh, at the same time both of them they are the main gods of the temple actually each one has his own temple his own uh, holy of holies and rituals so yeah so uh, this temple one of the most beautiful and uh, yeah not very well preserved but it's nice temple mm -hmm. yeah and the the reason it's split between the two gods they were actually brothers right 
They are brothers, yes. actually, yeah. So there was kind of a story there. Of <laughs> yeah. <those things. laughs> yeah, yeah, we have to know that everywhere and if any state of Egypt, we have a supreme god and the supreme god of the triads or the gods who are located in this city. So to make from these gods are very famous and very important and the holy gods and the creator gods, they have to, I mean, the priest creating a story and legend behind that. So they creating like the this god is the god of creation, the god who created created this the world. The world when I mean uh, when I mention the world, okay, it means that Egypt. So mm -hmm. so this uh, Komombo Island, according to the legend of Earth creation of Komombo, actually, they said that the the, the, the legend says that uh, there is God Ra and has two sons, God Sobek Ra and God Hurwer. Uh, God Hurwer was uh, very kind, very nice, and very peaceful. Actually, with the people, with the with the with the, uh, the creations who lives in this uh, Kumambo, and uh, God Sobekra, he was very sharp, not nice, not soft with them. So no one in love with with God Sobekra. So that why Sobekra he feel jealous of his brother, and then he asked him to leave the uh, the place to leave Kumambo because he want to be the only ruler in here. But at the same time, God Horwer, he refused. And he said that, no, I can't leave it because the, because our father chose this for us and he divide this throne between me and you. So uh, I cannot, uh, he told him that, he, told, he said that if you will not leave this place, I will kill you because the other one was very kind, very nice, very peaceful. He decided to leave without any problem, without any fighting, without any blood. Once he left the Komombo, all the creations followed him. Nobody stayed in Komombo. They didn't want to be there with the crocodile. So he <laughs> became the only person and the only creation, the only one stay in Komombo and he became the ruler but of himself. So that's why he used the magical spells to let the dead people return back to the first life. It's so weird. It's the opposite of what we've yes. talked a lot about. Yeah, actually, because they should, they should they believe that. And they, they have a very uh, uh, important text talking about resurrection and afterlife and rebirth and afterlife. But to let creations return to the first life, it's so weird. So that's why when he tell this magical spells and the recitations to let the dead people return back to the life, to the first life. So those creations, when they started to blend, doing plantations they planted gold and silver gold and silver no, no one can eat gold or silver so that why he found no way just to let his brother come to let all creations return back with him and then God is mad God is mad God is of justice she divided the throne between them actually and she divided the temple she divided everything and uh, yeah and we have the very important division scene between the temple of God Sobek and God Horus or Horwer uh, inside this great temple of Komombo. So it now is, when you visit today, it's split between both of them. Yes, but they have one offering table actually. One, I mean, uh, yeah. So the, this offering table showed, I mean, at the, in the first open court, we have seen it there. So the, we have just one big large uh, uh, altar or offering table so for both of them so anyone come and present wanted to present offering he should present it for both of them not only for one <laughs> you have to be careful yeah no that's a, a fascinating story you also mentioned you mentioned the crocodiles there were a bunch of mummified crocodiles found at this temple right yeah so many and so many undiscovered till today Crocodiles, actually, one of the symbols and the most holy form of God, Sobekra. And Sobek united with Gadra and he became Sobekra. So every season or every year, actually, they choose one of the crocodiles to be the holy one. And once this, this crocodile died, they mummified him and then they uh, bury him in the necropolis in the Shat city. The big cemetery of crocodiles or mummified crocodiles. So the ancient Egyptians, they never worshipped for those crocodiles as a crocodile, but they worshipped for hidden things which inside this crocodile. Because the crocodile going to the deepest part of the water, 
and then going to I mean the deep spot is very dark and then going up getting light 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 and then he get to the island so the full light so it symbols like the represents the sunrise and sunset the circle of the day also symbol of protection has a power yeah so uh, yeah the crocodile god is very important in ancient Egyptian mythology yeah yeah so that's a very good that's a choice. yeah that's a great overview of Kamambo temple and uh, this one is kind of right next to the water so it's much easier to, to access you can just kind of uh, get off the ship and, and walk right there. Or you can jump from the ship <laughs> to the, to the yes, temple. It's very too. easy. <laughs> it's very easy to go there. So yeah. very easy to access and a, a must hit spot on your way from Luxor down to Aswan. Any journey down the Nile from Luxor to Aswan must end with a visit to the Filet Temple in Aswan. This is one of the most famous sites in the city and one thing that makes this temple unique is it's actually on an island, right? Yeah, this temple actually, or this island included so many beautiful achievements. It is not only one temple, so many temples. But those temples now located not on Philae Island. It is located now in the, uh, on the uh, Angelic Island because Philae Island now under the water, covered by water because of the old dam. When the, uh, the, the Egyptians built the old dam in 1902 by Abbas Hamid II. So we have an artificial lake as well. This artificial lake covered the whole temple. So the UNESCO also started in 1960. Okay, they started the remove the, the temple cut it into pieces, okay, and then remove all the blocks and the columns and the walls and the shrines to the new one. So it was more than Abu symbol is kind of very famous for having been moved, but there were many others as well. No, 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 they, they removed uh, not only one temple, so many temples yeah. removed, like Kalapsha, like um, the, like, Dar, like the Philae temple, those temples had been removed as well, like Abu symbol. But Abu symbol is the most famous site and the most famous temple removed from the lakes. So this is removed from the lakes, uh, or we call it the, the stock water or the lake of uh, Aswan uh, Lock or Aswan Dam. But uh, the Abu Simbel because of the high dam, okay? So, uh, you know, Philae Island dedicated, originally the main cult in Philae Island actually, uh, the cult of goddess Isis, goddess of love and music and the wife of god Osiris and her husband Osiris and the little son. Horus. Uh, plus, we have another uh, temples dedicated to Arts and Fees and uh, uh, the Hadrian's Gates we have, and also we have the Chapel of Hathor, uh, Kiosk of Trajan, so many buildings, so many achievements on this island. So, it is the most famous archaeological site ever in Aswan. Yes, really. So, uh, because it's included very beautiful scenes, beautiful, unique scenes, uh, very preserved uh, scenes, and also we have graffiti from the uh, French expeditions when they followed the Mamluks till this uh, island. Uh, yeah, so Philae Island, it is the most important place that man can visit, yeah in Egypt. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, very nice. So yeah, it's definitely a, a must-hit spot then. What 
as people walk through the temple, what are some of the things they should like look out for? What are some of the highlights as you're walking through the temple? First of all, the the the, the, the adventure to go to the temple. You go, you just they have the only way to go to this temple by boat, small boat, okay, motor boat. You arrive there and then you'll find the island and then the chapel, which was built, dedicated to Goddess Hathor, built by King Nechtneb F. Uh, the second, the, I mean, uh, this is one of the most ancient achievements in this island. Plus, we have the colonnades and the columns, which built by the Greek, also, and uh, some of the Romans added in this. Also, the uh, the first pylon, which was built by King Ptolemy the Twelfth, and the first Owen Court, and the second pylon, and then the first type of hall. This first type of hall converted at the Coptic Church, by the way, one of the oldest churches in Egypt, because the Christians at the beginning of the of the religion in Egypt, so they started to use the the uh, the hall of columns as the churches in Egypt. So that why this one of the most ancient churches. And also the uh, the holy fall is at the end of the temple, uh, which was built by King Ptolemy the third, the third and his wife Arsuni the second. So they depicted on the walls while they are doing rituals and doing uh, some ceremonies inside the temple for the god uh, Osiris or goddess Isis as well. Uh, the, the complex, we, we should call it the complex of Philae. Also, the most interesting thing that the only temple dedicated to Imhotep, the architect of King Joseph from Third Dynasty, around 27th century BC, it's located in Philae Temple, the Philae Island. So we have the only temple for Imhotep, the one who worshipped. He was the architect of King Joseph, the one who built the step pyramid at Saqqara. And mm -hmm. actually, he worshipped during Greek God uh, uh, during Greek and Roman period as a god of architect and god of medicine. Uh, and he depicted in so many places. But he he have his own temple, and he uh, received the offerings in this temple, which is located in Philae Island. Yeah. yeah, this is very interesting part. Yeah. Very nice. So it's a unique journey to get there, and then the things you can see there are also uh, special and unique and kind of stand out from other sites in ancient Egypt. Yeah, this is a very unique place, very unique in everything, Arctic, history, uh, you know, uh, how to get there. So it's everything very unique. And very unique because why this island became very holy, very important, because Isis, you know that you know the story when Osiris killed by his brother and divided his body divided into 42 pieces. Isis and Nephthys, the, the two sisters, they united together and they flew, they fly everywhere to find to collect the pieces. And they found the leg of Osiris in the uh, in, uh, on uh, on the top of Big Island. Oh, so and the, the, what they call the Abaton. So the uh, bigger island include the right leg of Osiris, so the ancient Egyptians, they considered that the source of the Nile comes from the leg of Osiris. Yeah, so uh, yeah. After that, Isis, she decided to be in front of the uh, tomb of the great Abaton or the great leg of Osiris, her husband, okay, and she stayed in this Philae Island, and then the king started to build temples for her, her cult. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a very interesting thing that here. Fantastic. So yeah, another kind of the, the final stop for a lot of people coming down from Luxor. You'll hit up some of these other sites along the way, and then you'll end in Aswan and, and visit Philae Temple, and it's a fantastic journey. It's a fantastic journey, and it's like a dessert. You should do it. <laughs> you'll have to do it at the end, or yeah. If you have just one day, you just do this fillet temple. I mean, it's if you have no time, you just do fillet temple. Fillet temple is highlight. It's the high, one of the highlights in Egypt in general. Yeah. It's from the Roman period. By the way, it's not published yet. It's not published? Yeah. Nobody. I mean, published. Nobody did the translations for the text for uh, explanation for the scenes as well before. So anyway, this is like. Uh, the must have seen the bird and like the funeral procession, the Telugu jars, anopis. Yeah, like empalming, this is the soul returned back to the body of the deceased. It's so weird, it seems supposed to be in the temple and tombs, this seems, but it's 
So we're to have it inside the temples. So, and then here, it's, by the way, the hieroglyphics, what's written here in this chapel or this shrine, it's very complicated, very difficult, yeah. Because it's written, written during the late Roman period. And then here you can see Isis and Nephthys, they are pleasing their brother, God Osiris. And look at the winged scarab. So, and God Hab, get of the Nile. And look at the king here while he's beating the enemies. It looks like a small temple, like a pylon. You mm -hmm. see? Yeah. You can imagine this. It's something very interesting. So you can see here the most important scenes which represent the uh, king in front of God. Amun Khan would F and then Alpi, this Isis. Anubis and Wadid, Osiris, Nephthys, and Horus, and Nehbib. I think this is Wadid again. So, this is a very beautiful scene. has finished the journey down from Luxor and we've arrived into Aswan and while Aswan itself has many uh, amazing things to see today we took a expedition out to Abu Simbel the great temple of Ramses II or Ramses the Great uh, so this is what about a, a three and a half hour drive uh, from Aswan to get to this temple yes by car three and a half hour almost more or less but there's not one temple only in the Abu Simbel we have two temples very important two temples one for so God, uh, for King Ramses II and his wife, Queen Nefertari. So two temples. We shouldn't igno ignore the temple yeah. of Queen Nefertari. It's a very good <laughs> yes, temple. Yes, yes. Unlike Ramses, yeah. who put more, more of his statues on her temple than he had of her. <laughs> yeah, the temple. So actually, he was respecting his wife. At the same time, he was in love with himself. <laughs> yes. yes. So he depicted himself more than his wife in her temple. He made temple statues for himself more than his wife four times for him two times for her <laughs> so it was uh, so weird actually but in a way thanks God he built a temple for her <laughs> yes. yeah but in a way the uh, the temple of uh, I mean the two temples of Abu Simbel actually it's a, the big and the small one so they are very nice temples and uh, very well preserved temples uh, and everything very unique about these temples so unique about the architect, unique about the art itself, sculptures, about the history behind, actually the moving or this, uh, removing the temple actually from place to another place, because the whole, the whole, the two temples actually and so many other temples was covered by water because of the lakes Nasser. So uh, they moved it, UNESCO moved these temples from underneath from the water till the top hill of the mountain. Uh, very close from the original location. Because Egypt built the high dam, right? And then that, that water started. Yeah, that's started. why, because this is the stock water. I mean, the, 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 this lake started because of the high dam. Mm -hmm. So all those safe water, actually, we uh, we have it. So covered all the Nubian houses and Nubian villages, plus the temples, which located, supposed to be located in the way from Aswan to Abu Simbel area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that, this temple uh, started to move, uh, started, uh, they started this big project of moving this stone, uh, this temple from the original location to another place. So they uh, started in 1964 till 1968. So just four years to yeah. move this big mountain. Right, and it's not a just a temple, right. It's it built into mountain. the mountain. Yeah, it's yes, crazy. It's on, <laughs> this is the biggest and largest temple carved in the mountain, actually. So, uh, yeah, King Ramses II, he built, also he makes four series statues, massive statues for himself and uh, uh, little statues for his wives and daughters. The inner hall, we have the, for the, the pillared hall and the wall depicted with the Battle of uh, Kadesh against the Hittites. Uh, it's, uh, he represents his, his power inside this place and he represents his, the support of gods while they are helping him with their arms and hands and their uh, yeah, big support inside this uh, temple 
according to the scenes of the battle. This battle was very important because he depicted it on a bunch of different None spots. No, this battle is actually very, very important because King Ramses II was important. <laughs> yeah, because if Ramses II was important, this battle will be not important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very important because the uh, King Ramses II, we have a ba so many battles against the, 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 the Hittites from the period of King Sid the First and the other kings before. So we fight the Hittites all the time. Why the Hittites battles during the time of King Ramses II very, very important and very famous? Because of the peace treaty between Egypt and Hittites. It was the, the, the oldest and the first peace treaty ever in ancient times, not in ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. in ancient world, actually. So, uh, yeah, the this Battle of Kadesh depicted in uh, uh, and Ramses the second temple in Abydos and Ramses the first temple in Abydos, uh, Karnak temple, Luxor temple, uh, in the west bank of Luxor, Ramesium temple, and then in Abu Simple. So, uh, yeah, it depicted so many places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Every place or any place belongs directly to King Ramses II. He mentioned this battle and he always say, I win the battle, but he wasn't. Yeah, actually, uh, because we have uh, evidence on the other side, belongs to the king of Hittites, he said that I win the battle as well. So they both claim that they yeah, won? they both claim, actually. That's why they make the peace treaty, okay? So, uh, yeah, but it was, it was a very good thing to, to see the battle of Kadesh, the action, like you are watching a, you know, action movie. The king fighting and beating the enemies. The king over the chariots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, the scenes are just incredible as you walk around the temple. But this was also very much like so so much of the the temples in, in Egypt, uh, a propaganda piece for Ramses the second. And he had these massive statues out front, and then he really elevated himself to the the highest heights of the gods uh, with with his comparisons throughout the temple. Yeah, actually the uh, the holy of holies. This temple at the beginning. So the, this temple not dedicated to triad, man and wife and son. Most of the temples the were, were uh, the dedicated the, to uh, a tree. Most of the temples had the triad yeah. actually, but this temple not. This temple includes statue for God Ra Harakhti, King Ramses II, God Amr Ra, and God uh, Bitah. God Bitah he worshipped as a god of art and artisans and god of darkness as well. So. Uh, King Ramses II, he chose why he chose those certain gods specifically, because those gods actually they are the creator gods according to the Earth creation legend. So each one has Earth creation legend in mm -hmm. his state. So for example, Raharacht in Heliopolis, the creator god according to Heliopolis legend of Earth creation. Also the god the Amor Ra about Thebes and uh, god Betah in Memphis. So King Ramses II one of them. So he he he, he mentioned himself as, as a god in so many places, but here he put himself in the same level of the creator gods. Was he the first pharaoh to do that? To put himself at that that level? That, that level, yeah. Okay. He's, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. But the ancient Egyptian gods, uh, kings in general, they worship. They, they consider themselves as the gods. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that level, King Ramses second, yes. So uh, and the very interesting thing that. When this, uh, we have the sun dry, the, the sun united with the faces of the gods in, uh, inside the holy follies. The sun rises every, uh, I mean every year twice. Okay, twice every year. Actually, uh, once the first one in 22 of October, and the second one in 22 of November. So the sun rises and going crossing from the uh, gateway until united with the first figure of the first god statue on his face, God Raharakhti, and then King Rams II, and then Amur Ra, but never rises over the face of God Bitah. Because he's the God of Darkness. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, that why. So that's happening, that's the coronation day and per day, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, so so much to see between both of the temples there, and the fact that it's kind of on the the, the shore, the shore of the lake as well. So the the setting of it is very unique, and yeah, it yeah. just feels it's very nice. Very there. unique, yes. But uh, if we work like just three four minutes from the big temple, we'll arrive to the other temple, 
which he dedicated to his beloved wife, and he married her with Goddess Hathor, and he depicted on the facade depicted, and he made four standing statues for himself and two series, two standing statues for his wife. But he wrote a very nice text on the facade of the of the, of the temple. Actually, he said. Because of your face, the sun rises. I mean, uh, the sun rises because of your face. Every Beautiful. Day. Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, this uh, temple inside, very beautiful, very colorful. There are scenes representing Queen Nefertari crowned by the two horns and sandals crowned to be in the same level of gods. We have a very unique scene, uh, scene of coron uh, coronation for King Ramses II. He crowned by God Set, the evil god, and God Horus. Okay, so uh, Horus and Set always in challenge and fighting each other. And Horus he killed Set because Set killed his father. So it's so weird to find both of them. They are sharing one ceremony of coronation. This is the symbol of power of King Ramses II because Ramses he want to say that I am the uh, the one who supported by all gods. Evil and good gods. Yeah. Yeah? That's a very, yeah, very interesting, you know, because Ram Second was very smart. Yeah. The, the drive out there is also unique. So like we said, it takes about three and a half hours. We got caught in kind of a, a bit of a lot of wind, kind of a sandstorm that came through. At one point, you could barely see anything out of the car yeah, at all. There was like zero, yeah. zero visibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sandstorm, actually, it's happened maybe every year once or two times, but not that much, but sometimes came very, very strong sandstorm so you cannot see even one meter is in front of you <laughs> yes. like in Europe and the, 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 the cold countries actually found snow on mm -hmm. the streets yeah cloudy sometimes but here sand and hot very yes. hot yeah very hot so this is very important yeah very very hot but you absolutely have to do the journey out to Abu Simbel uh, when you're in Aswan so you can drive out there's a, there is an airport there so you can fly but would you recommend you driving no, you can fly, yeah, but if you are, uh, you don't like to drive a uh, long way, actually, so many hours driving, okay, you can take the plane, but also you will go and you have a, a car to go to the airport and then you have to wait for the plane, then go and then go out from the airport and then you will take a car right. to go to the temple and then return back <laughs> to the temple. I mean, it's not, it's, not, yeah, it, it's normal if you like this or this, so many options. Yeah. But by the time you hassle with everything other, with the airport. Other, uh, yeah. And we have another way to do this, or to, to visit Abu Simbel, night cruise. Oh yeah. Also behind the dam. You just have to, the so three, you can't. The three nights or three or four nights to do this, uh, not only Abu Simbel, you do the tours from beginning of Aswan, I mean from Kalapsha, Subu Adar, Amada, all those temples until you arrive to uh, Abu Simbel. So these are on the other side of the dam. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so you, you can go from like Luxor to Aswan and then on a different ship. Yeah, different ship. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. So, so, so some fun options to look into there if you're interested in visiting Abu Simbel. Highly recommend it. Uh, Ramses II left behind so many incredible like creations and so many records. Uh, as you said, he was in love with himself, so <laughs> we, we have a lot from him, and yes. it's amazing to visit. <laughs> yes, Ramses II, the most famous king. Perfect, thank you. More famous than me. <laughs>
Now, uh, a cruise will take you from Luxor down to Aswan, typically. You can also start in Aswan and come up to Luxor, just kind of depending on uh, what day of the week you start and what your itinerary looks like. The way our trip worked is we had a couple days in Luxor with our tour guide, and then we set sail and visited the uh, Kamambo and uh, Edfu temples on the way down to Aswan. Now there was really only about one and a half days of uh, sailing on the actual cruise trip, so you don't get a ton of time actually sailing on the water because the distance you're traveling from Luxor to Aswan isn't super long, but it's really just the experience of being on the Nile and uh, reaching the different temples from the water that's so incredible. Now, throughout our trip, we had our own tour guide, so there were two of us on the trip, and we had our own tour guide that joined us uh, on board. I would highly recommend doing that, so he started with us in Luxor and showed us around the, the sites in Luxor, Valley of the Kings, Karnak Temple, all of those incredible sites uh, for a couple days, and then he sailed on the boat with us and went down to uh, the Edfu Temple, the Kamambo Temple, and then all the way through to Aswan and showed us around there as well. The ship itself was very nice. This was something that we were a little concerned about. So if you're familiar with Egypt is at all, kind of their economy, the infrastructure in the country, um, you're never really sure what you're going to get when you set out on a journey uh, like this. And so we weren't sure how nice the boat would be compared to what you might think of for your, your typical cruise ship, especially a river cruise ship that can be very nice in places like Europe or even a, a bigger cruise like Mediterranean cruise ship or a Caribbean cruise ship. So we weren't really sure how it would compare to that. We were on the Semiramis 3, uh, which is one of the higher, what they call kind of a luxury cruise line, though the word luxury kind of takes on a different meaning when you're in Egypt compared to a lot of other parts of the country. Um, same with like the overnight train trip that we took from Cairo down to Luxor, which they also called a luxury over overnight uh, accommodations. And I wouldn't really call that luxury either, but we have a different video on that that you can check out as well. So uh, in this case, uh, luxury was uh, very nice in a lot of ways. So um, the, the food on the ship, for instance, uh, we were very happy with. There was a, a lot of good food and quite a nice variety um, from desserts to main foods. There was usually a couple different types of meat. You had some seafood represented. There were salads, um, lots of different breads to choose from. So overall, I thought that, that part of the experience was uh, very nice. Um, the room on board, obviously that's a big part of it. Uh, the room we were happy with in the end as well. We actually uh, recorded uh, a room tour while we were on board, so you can check that out now. Obviously a major part of any cruise ship is the rooms themselves. Before we even get into the room here, I love these hallways with the cool looking room doors and then the yellow lighting throughout the hallway as well. I think it really sets that Egyptian feeling theme. So let's go in and check out the room. We've just checked in today, so this is all new for us so far, just kind of getting the lay of the land. We can start with the bathroom here. Uh, one, one thing that's noticeable right off the bat is it's a pretty good size for a, a cruise ship feel, so that's nice. A lot of ships, you'll have a very small bathroom, but uh, some decent amount of room uh, to move around in. Uh, you've got the mirror here, and then a, a good sized shower as well, so that's a nice sign. We'll uh, update you later in the video on kind of how everything works, and and uh, how happy you are with the, the service with all of that. We close the door here, you've got a, a large closet. So you can open this and you've got some extra pillows, I think some bathrobes, maybe some safety equipment in the bottom there. And then I think this door is more just your regular closet. So you've just got some hanger space here as well. So there's space to hang up clothes if you need to. Come into the room, you've got uh, two beds in here, and again, uh, a some fair amount of space uh, for a shipboard room. Um, you've got some room with a safe in between here on the kind of the bed stand in the middle, and then a couple of chairs and a small table over here. One of the, the highlights of these Nile cruise ships is this massive window. So I believe every room on board has a large window like this. Right now, we haven't left the dock yet, but when we do, we'll have a beautiful view of the Nile and all the landscape as it goes by. Moving over to the desk, you've got a good amount of space to work with here. Right now, we've got a bunch of our stuff laid out and a bunch of uh, water that we brought on board as well. They provide some drinks and a uh, water boiler if you want to make tea or coffee, that sort of thing. You can slide out this seat and turn it into a desk as well if you'd like. 
So these are kind of first impressions, general look at the room. Uh, everything looks pretty good so far. There's even a TV you can use here as well. Only negatives we've noticed is uh, specifically in the bathroom and a little bit in the room, just some kind of like wear and tear, things looking a little bit worn on the boat. So we'll see if that really affects kind of day-to-day -day use. But besides that, uh, very happy so far and looking forward to seeing more on the ship. Looking back on our trip, we were very happy with the whole room set up and how everything operated in there. We had a slight problem with uh, the door not working properly, but they were able to come and fix that uh, during the cruise, so that worked out fine in the end. Um, the large picture window is incredible. That makes the trip so much better because it does get extremely hot in Egypt. Even when we were there, which was the beginning of April, it was 110 degrees for a lot of days. Uh, heading, heading down to Aswan from Luxor. So you don't want to necessarily spend a lot of time outdoors on the top of the ship, but being able to have that incredible view from inside your room where the air conditioning works well was so nice. So in the end, there was uh, plenty of space uh, in the, the room itself and in the bathroom, and we were happy with how everything worked. But speaking of the other areas on board the ship, there is that top deck. It has a pool area. We spent a little bit of time in the pool um, which is nice to cool down, especially on those hot days, but again, you've got to be careful being out in the sun too much, especially when it gets to that really intense heat, kind of hitting, uh, you know, noon and then into the afternoon. There was a, a whole bunch of kind of shaded uh, deck area with kind of a bar on top as well. Um, you could sit in the shade, but even in the shade, the heat still gets really intense. As far as other areas on the ship, uh, you had like a bar lounge area. So that was a, a pretty nice, pretty fancy area where they would hold some events, some parties. You could also just relax in there. Um, and that had some furniture and just kind of a comfortable place to relax. And then there was the dining room as well. So the dining room is where all of the meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, were served. And I talked about earlier some of the good food there uh, that we enjoyed. And you would come back on the ship uh, every day for, to, to eat your meals. So you would start with breakfast, you would go out and tour, come back and eat lunch, and then typically go out and tour some more before coming back for dinner. Now, one of the things you want to think about when uh, booking your Nile cruise is how many days you have available. So we did a five-day cruise, which just starts in Luxor and ends in Aswan. Another option that uh, people can do is a seven-day cruise, and that starts in Luxor, takes you to Aswan, but then comes back and ends in Luxor as well. The nice thing about that would be if you have the time, you could get a little more sailing time on the Nile itself, since like I said, it's only about a day, day and a half of actual time that you're, you've spent sailing uh, during the cruise if you just go from Luxor uh, down to Aswan. Uh, another definite tip that I would recommend is to add on a visit to Abu Simbel to your Nile cruise ship. So Abu Simbel is about a three hour drive from uh, Aswan. It's on the shores of uh, Lake Nasser, an incredible site, uh, one of the most famous temples in all of Egypt. And even though it's very remote and takes a while to get out to, highly, highly recommend it. It's, it's a really incredible place on the shores of Lake Nasser. Uh, definitely wanna add that on to your trip if you're going to take the time to do the cruise uh, down to Aswan anyway. So that's kind of an overview uh, of the trip. Um, any travel in Egypt is very unique just due to uh, the, the way the country is run and the logistics of everything. So uh, it's, it's always going to be an adventure no matter what you do. Uh, one of the most unique things about this was when you got off the ship, you almost always crossed through the decks of like three or four other ships because they would just kind of uh, dock right next to each other. So instead of all docking separately, uh, right next to the, the shore, you would have to walk across several other ships to get to the actual uh, shoreline itself. So that was one of the surprising things, uh, just the way that they operate all of the ships uh, going down the Nile, because there are a whole bunch of these, and they're all trying to stop at uh, the same temples at the same time, so uh, it can be hard logistically. But definitely an adventure. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic way to explore uh, more of Egypt. You get to see so many amazing sites between Luxor and the, the temples on the way down and then everything to see in Aswan. And then if you add on Abu Simbel as well, uh, it's definite must do trip and I highly recommend checking it out. We'll put uh, links to some info about the ship that we were on personally. Uh, so that's kind of the one I can speak to in terms of all the, the rooms and everything I've been talking about. But there are a ton of these ships that sail. So there's lots of different options and I would definitely look into some different companies and, and see what uh, you can find. Our ship was booked for us through the tour guide that we had. So you can do that or you can, you can book it online yourself as well. 
that's kind of an, an overview of our whole experience. I, I hope you have a great time if you're able to make it to Egypt and explore uh, more of the incredible history that that country has to offer. Thanks for watching.